Okay, so everyone loves engineering, right? The amazing things we can build. Absolutely, pushing the boundaries of what's possible. But, uh, you know, there's always that little part of you, maybe it's just me, that wonders, like, what if it goes wrong? Oh yeah, for sure. The higher you build, the harder they fall. Right, exactly. And today we're gonna dive into some of the most impactful engineering mistakes in history. We're not just talking about like, oops, we put the beam in backward. Right, right, no, we're talking about failures that sent shockwaves yeah. through the entire field of engineering. Exactly, these events change skylines, they change how we think, how we design and build. Huge impact, yeah. Big impact. So we're gonna be looking at the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, the Kansas City Hyatt Regency walkway collapse. Oh yeah. The Boston Big Dig, and even the more recent Surfside condominium collapse in Florida. A lot to unpack there. Each one a tragedy, obviously. Absolutely. But with some really important lessons learned. Yeah, and you know, it's tragic, but I think there's also this like morbid fascination, you know? Right, for sure. Like, how could this happen? What went wrong? Yeah, and each of these failures, as devastating as they were, they actually had this silver lining. Okay. They forced the engineering world to kind of take a step back and say, okay, what are we missing? Yeah. How do we prevent this from happening again? Right. And that led to some huge advancements in design, materials, even regulations. Right. So they weren't all for nothing. Not at all. OK, good. So let's start with the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. This was 1940, nicknamed Galloping Gertie. Ah, yeah, Galloping Gertie, the classic example. It's this beautiful, sleek suspension bridge. And I think most people have seen the footage of it, right? Like twisting and undulating in the wind. It's wild. It looks like something out of a movie, but uh, it was very real. And then it just collapses, plunges right into the water. And this was only four months after it opened. Crazy, right? You'd think state-of-the-art bridge is 1940, should be good to go. But uh, there were some major oversights. Yeah, I mean, how do you miss something like that? Well, the thing is, the engineers knew the bridge was moving. I mean, it was nicknamed Galloping Gertie for a reason. Right, right. They even installed these dampeners to try and stabilize it. So they knew there was a problem. They knew there was movement, but what they didn't fully grasp was this phenomenon called aeroelastic flutter. Okay, break that down for me, aeroelastic flutter. So basically, it wasn't just the wind pushing on the bridge. It was the wind interacting with the shape of the bridge. Mm -hmm. And that created these oscillations. And those oscillations, they started to amplify themselves. Like a feedback loop. Exactly. A feedback loop that just kept getting worse and worse until, boom, the bridge couldn't handle it anymore. So it wasn't just that the bridge was like too weak, it was this really complex interplay between the design and these like unanticipated aerodynamic effects. Yeah, it was a combination of factors that they just hadn't fully considered. So Galloping Gertie, was she doomed from the start or was there something that could have been done differently? Well, hindsight's twenty twenty, right. But the Tacoma Narrows Bridge collapse was a huge wake up call for the engineering community. Mm -hmm. It highlighted the importance of understanding these dynamic forces at play, especially with wind, you know, with these wind sensitive structures. Right. So like even though we can't always see those forces, we can't ignore them. Right. So that led to a lot of changes in how bridges are designed and tested. Oh, absolutely. And a major one was the widespread use of wind tunnel testing. This lets engineers study how wind interacts with the bridge design before you even start building. OK, yeah, makes sense. Test it before you build it. Exactly. But that's Fascinating. Something seemingly invisible, like the wind could bring down this massive structure, really shows you the power of nature. Absolutely. Nature always bats last. Yeah, true. Yeah. Okay, let's shift gears a bit. Let's talk about the Kansas City Hyatt Regency walkway collapse. This was 1981. Yeah, a busy Friday night. Dance competition. A lot of people enjoying themselves, and then tragedy struck. Yeah, just a horrific scene. You have these two suspended walkways packed with people. Right above the crowded atrium. And then suddenly they just give way and collapse, crashing down onto the people below. The death toll was staggering. 114 people lost their lives. Oh, awful. Just awful. And what makes it even more tragic is that it could have been prevented. Really? How so? This disaster really highlighted the importance of communication, like clear communication and really meticulous review processes throughout the design and construction phases. Right, so like dotting your I's, crossing your T's. Yeah, and making sure everyone's on the same page. You see, the initial design for the walkways called for these continuous support rods. Okay. But during construction, this was changed to separate rods. Seemed like a minor adjustment at the time. I'm guessing it wasn't so minor. No, that minor adjustment actually doubled the load on certain connections. 
and they just weren't strong enough to bear that weight. So they just snap. Basically, yeah. And what's even more troubling is that this detail, this change, it seems to have slipped through the cracks during the review process. Oh, wow. Which really underscores the need for thorough checks and balances at every single stage of a project. Okay, so it wasn't like a flaw in the original design itself. It was this breakdown in communication during the construction that led to the collapse. That's the key takeaway. And yeah. it really changed the way people thought about engineering, the way they thought about communication. The Hyatt Regency disaster showed that even seemingly small alterations can have this ripple effect that can compromise the integrity of the whole structure. Wow, that's sobering. Every decision matters. It really does. Every detail. It's a domino effect, right? Yeah. And the industry, they recognized that. They knew they needed to prevent these kinds of disasters, and they started looking at it systemically. Systemically. Meaning, they started to make sure that everyone involved, from the designers, the engineers, to the construction crews, everybody understood the implications of every single decision. Okay, that makes sense. So it's not just about building something that looks good on paper. Right. It's going to work in the real world. It's got to work in the real world with real people. Exactly. Okay, well, let's move on to a project that was actually intended to be, you know, this marvel of engineering. Okay. And that's the Boston Big Dig. Ambitious project. Very ambitious. The idea was to bury this major highway underground. Alleviate traffic congestion. Yeah, transform the city's landscape, make it all beautiful. A lot of good intentions. It was supposed to be this triumph of engineering. But it didn't quite go as planned, did it? No, not quite. In 2006, there was this tragedy. A section of the tunnel ceiling collapsed, killed a motorist. Just a terrible, terrible accident. Yeah. And it really raised questions about the safety of the entire project. The big, big, you know, it was supposed to be this huge improvement for the city, but uh, it ended up showing just how hard it is to balance, you know, these big innovative ideas right. with keeping things on budget and making sure it's all safe in the long run. Yeah. And I think a lot of people, when they hear about the big dig collapse, they just think, oh, is that bad epoxy, right? Case closed. Right. Like one bad batch and the whole thing falls apart. Exactly. But I have a feeling it's a little more complicated than that. It always is, right? Yeah. It's tempting to just point to one thing, like the epoxy, and say, there's the culprit. Right. But the investigation, you know, it showed that it was way more complicated. Okay. Yeah. The epoxy itself, it wasn't as strong as it should have been. Mm-hmm. But the decisions made way back when they were planning the project, those played a big role, too. What kind of decisions? Well, like what materials to use, how they were installed, things like that. I see. So was there pressure maybe to cut costs or to finish the project faster, even if it meant cutting corners? That's a good question. These huge infrastructure projects, they often have immense pressure to stay on schedule and within budget. Right. But uh, the big dig, it shows us that shortcuts especially when it comes to safety, those shortcuts can have devastating consequences. It's kind of scary to think about, right? Yeah. Like we marvel at these huge projects, these feats of engineering, but we don't always think about all the little decisions, the potential compromises that happen along the way. It's like a, it's easy to focus on the shiny finished product. Right. But you got to remember, there's a whole lot that goes on behind the scenes. Yeah. And sometimes those things we don't see, those are the things that matter most. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's not about placing blame after a tragedy. You know, right. it's about building a culture in engineering where safety comes first. Always. OK, well, speaking of complex projects, potential compromises, let's talk about the Surfside condominium collapse. This was back in 2021. I think a lot of people remember seeing that image of the building partially collapsed. Just horrifying. Yeah, that one really hit home for a lot of people. Yeah. Because it wasn't a bridge, it wasn't a tunnel, it was a place where people lived, a place where they should have felt safe. Exactly. And while the final investigation report's still in the works, early findings, they point to a mix of things. Like what? Years of delayed maintenance, possible problems with the initial design. So not just one thing, but a bunch of things coming together. Right, a perfect storm almost. It's unsettling to think that a building, you know, an ordinary apartment building could just suddenly collapse. It makes you wonder how many other buildings are out there right. just waiting to happen. It's a scary thought. And the Surfside tragedy, it really sparked a lot of discussion about building safety. Okay. Yeah. Especially for older structures. Makes sense. Like how often are they inspected? Are they being maintained properly? Yeah. And are the building codes strong enough 
especially in places like Florida. Right, on the coast. Exactly, where you have all that salt water, the humidity. Yeah, that can really wear things down. It can definitely speed up deterioration. So we've talked about some pretty high-profile cases, mm. these big catastrophic failures. But I'm curious, are these always caused by like a single major oversight? Or can it be more subtle than that? Like a slow buildup of, I don't know, smaller issues? That's a great question. And it's something that engineers think about a lot. You see, it's rarely just one big mistake. It's usually a bunch of smaller decisions, compromises, things you don't anticipate, Aww. all happening over time. And they create the conditions for disaster. It's like, think of it like a chain reaction. Okay. One weak link, it might not break the chain, right? but add more weak links, and eventually the whole thing snaps. So it's about looking at the big picture. Exactly. Looking at the entire lifespan of a structure. Okay. From the design, the construction, the maintenance, all the way to the end. Each stage can have its successes and its failures. And I guess that's where the idea of resilient design comes in. You were talking about that earlier. Yeah, resilient design, it's basically a way of thinking that accepts that at some point things might fail. Okay. So you try to anticipate those weaknesses and build in safeguards. So it can handle those unexpected stresses. Right. It's like instead of trying to make something perfect, which is impossible. Right. You try to design something that can bend without breaking. I like that. So what are some of the key elements of resilient design? Well, one big one is redundancy. Redundancy. It means having backup systems. So if one thing fails, something else can take over. Oh, I see. Like, uh, what's a good example? Like in a hospital, they have backup generators, right? Exactly. So if the power goes out, the hospital can still function. That makes sense. So we're basically building safety nets into our structures. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Okay, what else? Another important thing is fail-safe mechanisms. These are parts that are designed to fail. Wait, what? You're designing things to fail? Yeah, but in a controlled way. So they prevent a bigger, more dangerous failure from happening. Okay, I'm not sure I follow. Think of a circuit breaker in your house. Okay. If there's a power surge, the circuit breaker trips. Right, and it shuts off the power. Exactly, it fails. But by failing, it protects your wiring, prevents a fire. Ah, uh, okay. So it's like a controlled burn. In a way, yeah. By letting something small fail. You prevent something much worse. Exactly. And these ideas, they can be applied to all sorts of structures. Bridges, skyscrapers, even airplanes. So we're talking about designing for the unexpected. That's a big part of it, yeah. But all this talk about design materials, it makes me wonder... Where do people fit into all of this? What do you mean, like the human element? Yeah, we're not all engineers, but we live in these buildings. We drive on these bridges every day. That's a really important point. Public awareness, it plays a huge role in all of this. Okay, how so? Well, informed citizens, they can ask the right questions. Okay. Hold people accountable. Advocate for safer practices. We can all push for better building codes, better inspections, you know, a culture of safety. So it's not just the responsibility of the engineers. Exactly. It's everyone's responsibility. We all have a role to play. We're all in this together, right? Right. Well, we've talked about resilient design, the role of inspections. But it strikes me that engineering at its core, it's a human endeavor. Absolutely. And humans, well, we make mistakes. We can have all the best technology, all these fancy systems. But in the end, it's people making the decisions, calling the shots. Yeah, you can't escape the human factor. So how do we account for that? I mean, how do you factor in human error? Oversights? Sometimes maybe just bad judgment? Well, you got to start by recognizing that engineers, they're just like everyone else. Okay. They're under pressure, deadlines, budgets. And they're susceptible to, you know, cognitive biases. Cognitive biases. Yeah, like those mental shortcuts our brains take. Sometimes those shortcuts, they lead to bad decisions. Okay, can you give me an example of how that might play out in engineering? Sure. Let's go back to the big, big. Yeah, the epoxy was a problem, but the investigation, it also found that communication between the teams, it wasn't great. Okay, so people weren't talking to each other. Well, they were talking, but critical information wasn't always getting through. Warning signs were missed, and there was this sense of urgency, maybe, that kind of overshadowed everything else. So it's not just about having the right information. It's about making sure that information gets to the right people and yeah. that they actually act on it. Exactly. And that's where building a culture of safety comes in. It's about making it clear that everyone's responsible for safety and that it's okay to speak up if you see something that's not right. It's like, you know, those airplane crash investigations mm -hmm. where they find out that a bunch of small miscommunications or misjudgments led to this huge disaster. The aviation industry, they've actually done a lot of research on human factors. Yeah. 
and they've come up with some good strategies for mitigating those risks. Like what? Well, there's this thing called crew resource management, CRM. It's all about communication and teamwork in the cockpit. So everyone feels empowered to speak up if they see a problem. So we can borrow some ideas from aviation, apply them to engineering? Exactly. Learn from their successes and failures. Mm -hmm. It's all about creating a safer, more resilient engineering environment. What are some other things we can do to address the human element in engineering? Well, education is huge. We need to train engineers, not just in the technical stuff, but also those soft skills. Soft skills. Yeah, communication, teamwork, critical thinking, yeah. ethical decision-making, all that stuff. So it's not just about being a brilliant engineer. You also need to be a good communicator, a good team player. Right, and you got to be able to think critically about your own work, be able to spot your own biases, your own blind spots. Makes sense. So we need to raise a new generation of engineers. Yeah, engineers who are not just technically skilled, but also, you know, aware of their limitations. Rumble. Exactly. And that, wait, what else? Well, we also need to create work environments where people feel safe speaking up. Okay. Where they can challenge assumptions, report mistakes, without being afraid of, you know, getting in trouble. Right, no blame culture. Exactly. we got to move away from that blame culture and instead focus on learning from our mistakes. Because mistakes are gonna happen. They always do. It's how we respond that matters. Right, when a mistake happens, we gotta see it as an opportunity to learn, to improve our processes. And that's how we prevent bigger disasters in the future. This has been a really fascinating deep dive. We've covered a lot of ground from the physics of these failures to the psychology of decision-making. So as we wrap up here, what's the one thing you really want our listeners to take away from all of this? Engineering at its core, it's about people. It's about the choices we make, the actions we take. Okay. And safety, it's everyone's responsibility. It takes constant vigilance, open communication, and a willingness to learn from our mistakes. And to all our listeners out there, whether you're an engineer, a student, or just someone who lives in the world, surrounded by these structures, remember, you have a role to play in creating a safer world. Ask questions. Speak up if you see something that doesn't look right. You might just save a life. That's a great point. Well, thank you for joining us on this deep dive into engineering disasters. We'll be back soon with another fascinating topic. Until then, stay safe and keep exploring the world around you.